Hello, welcome to the fifth installment of the Bite Size Blueprint Blether. Um, today, the topic is going to be session design and flow. We're lucky to be joined by a couple of new people who've decided to come and join us. Um, we've got Chris Reed to my left here, who is the newest member of the game development team. And we've also got Claire Krukrank, who's joined us from um, Scottish Futures. So we were with the Scottish national team and most prominently Edinburgh University, recently a really successful programme. Um, I'm still Scott Riddle and this is still James Wade as well. Um, we've managed to make it on each blueprint blether so far. But yeah, so Chris, good to good to have you on. How are, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Looking forward to this. It's dropped in at the deep end, I would suggest, but I'm looking forward to it. All good, all good. And then, uh, Claire, great to have you on. What, uh, you know, what's been going on recently? What's all, what's all happening? Yeah, thanks for having me first. Um, yeah, it's been, been a busy period for me. Um, we've had a lot with the university in terms of the Bucks programme, but just finished working with the Scottish Thistles. So that was a, about a seven and a half week campaign programme for the Celtic Challenge. And uh, so that finished on Saturday. Um, and now building into the Scottish Futures programme as well. So yeah, a busy couple of months coming up as well. Tons and tons. Yeah. Uh, how many evenings are you out each night, each week at the moment? Um, pretty much every, every evening during the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, depending if we have a uni game, Thursday, Friday, and then currently weekends as well. So yeah, busy time. Cool, nice. So with being so busy, um, we're going to jump straight into it, I think. Obviously, like you're planning and your organisation is a huge element of, you know, coaching. What would be, in your opinion, the biggest, like, the biggest factor in all of that? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit OCD in my planning, so um, I guess that probably helps with this period. I like to be really organised in terms of my, my session plans. Um, I do a lot of stuff on SharePoint, Dropbox, um, that kind of platform teams try to make sure that it's collaborative with all the coaches so yeah being planned is really important for me so that because we maybe don't have as much touch points in terms of time together as, as coaches because we're all a little bit um, sporadic and where we are we've got different jobs uh, it means that we can collaborate and make sure when we go into the session we know exactly what we're doing it's all in one place rather than maybe what I used to do previously was take pictures of session plans written down in notebooks, fire them to coaches, and before you know it, you're not quite sure who's on what session plan, and you're scrolling through your phone trying to find the pictures and WhatsApp. So, uh, yeah, I find that a lot better way of working now. Uh, allows everyone to share their information as well. Yeah, I think that's massive having that, you know, option to to make changes initially, and it's not you know a screenshot that's set in stone or you know, having other people input into it or maybe sharing that load a wee bit, I think is really important. Um, Chris, you're, you're doing a lot at the moment with some of the, the boys regional stuff. Um, what, what do their, what does that sort of planning process look like? So we have a long block of, of planning. So we had a run into the first games this weekend, the regional academy games. So we've been planning for like eight week blocks coming in. Uh, it's led by two of the coaches at the regional academy, like Millen and, and Ewan will lead that session plans will come out during the week or the weekend prior to a Monday session. We'll train Monday, Wednesday evenings, so session will come in on a Monday or a Sunday and we'll, we'll share the idea, we'll chalk through it and then we'll, we'll then send it out to all the coaches. So everybody's the same. But the planning is ahead for what we're looking to achieve over that eight week block leading into the game. So it's not just week to week. It's about how we're trying to develop the young players from generally the under 16s I work with from the beginning of the season right through to, to the game time. And then post that as well, going to under 17 programs. Nice, so like a real proactive approach. Um, James, what would your focuses be for, you know, planning ahead? Obviously, you've been doing um, coaching with Glasgow Uni for, for a couple of seasons now. What would be the main focuses that you would look to to have when, when planning for them? Could I, I could probably chip in with this as well, because like the university seasons are quite a very distinct, you have very distinct blocks. So obviously you've got exams, semesters, uh, relatively late starts. You've got people coming from all over Scotland and the UK who arrive relatively late on into the year for freshers week, usually, let's be honest. So you have to factor in things like that. So it's basically looking at what do you want to achieve, what kind of prep time you have, facility access. There's going to be challenges that loads of coaches probably all over Scotland do, like what, uh, what access to facilities can you get? We won 
well, Glasgow Union and four teams have taken a wee bit of a step back this year, but there's four teams, one pitch, half an Astro sometimes. Um, no matter how good the programme is, I've seen Edinburgh Union, one of the top female programmes in the UK, and it's start to share facilities because it's part of such a big organisation. So all those elements are in there, and it's almost like a, a game plan, very collaborative with the players. Um, you get a whole new raft of players each year, so it's, it's a balance between the way you want to play, but also what tools you have available, and the tools constantly change. So it's a balance, like, can we get them into play, but you might get a bit of an X-factor play, or if a whole raft of players in a different position that might enable you to do something you've not really had. I remember the time we got a left-footed kicker, that was a bit of gold dust, so we kind of worked around that, actually, what kind of games can we use, and things like that. So it's very holistic, um, players' personalities, how they got in their lives, in their social lives, as, uh, sorry, their university lives, we've got to factor that in and planning as well. So you might have sessions where we turn up and just play a bit of football because it's been a stressful period because of exams and things like that. So it's holistic. I think it's like, the rugby's a big part of it, but what, what I learned over the university one is to make it quite holistic because it's part of an experience, probably a bit wider than just the rugby. I don't know if that's something you resonate with as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think the other thing is like looking at, uh, you say those periods during the season where they're going to be ha having to focus on other things. So mm -hmm. they might have exams and um, they might have a heavy period depending on what what national programme they're in, especially for us with yeah. the females. So we have to try and look at that, you know, who who's coming, you know, to training that night. So making sure that we know of our squad of X number of players that some of them might not be there that night and that takes away 80% of your backs, for example. So what might the session focus be, be that night? Yeah. Or do we need to then bring some players up who maybe play in our second team or our third team who could cope with some of that skill development stage? Um, so we've got to be a little bit organised and know who's going to turn up. Mm -hmm. Because, as you know, session planning for 10 people or 40 people is is slightly different. So, again, it's been organised for me to make sure that I know exactly who's going to show up um, and what players are going to show up, not just numbers, what players, because what I might deliver to this group will be slightly different to what I might deliver to that group based on their, their skill level, their knowledge, their experience, their, their game exposure. So, yeah. yeah. That play engagement part, knowing how to make maximise for each it's, it's, it's quite a big aim in it, but trying to maximise like every kind of p player's experience of that one session. So the, all these planning tools are really important. There's loads of great apps and things like that, like Spond and I don't know what other ones that people use, but Facebook, we're still an old school, like the posts if you come to training tonight kind of group. And, and it might be that, yeah. you know, within that, you, you've got your, your stock practices, games that you use, but yeah. you just have to adapt them slightly depending on who's there because because of different skill levels or, or experiences or game knowledge um, or different focuses if it's a first 15 player to a, a third 15 mm -hmm. player. You know, they've got different focuses for their games coming up. So, um, yeah, just being organised so you can adapt all the way through. And that's the principle I think we're going to touch on now is kind of stock activities. Like, I think there's a thing that we have to be like completely creative and new with every session, but actually creating a bit of certainty around certain things allows players to kind of... Right, I know what this game is. I can really push my performance in these activities. It allows you to play with it for certain different things. So I'm sure we'll all talk about the stock things that we have in our sessions for session design. I've seen some cool ones with sevens and things like that. We have to get sevens in. It's Scott's thing for this for this uh, blether. So, yeah. Always have to mention sevens. But <laughs> we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Chris, what's, what's, uh, you know, what's a great session for you? What's, your, what's been your like, favourite session recently? What's it all involved? I suppose it's the under-16 stuff in Glasgow is brilliant because you've got a group of young lads who've come from the clubs who's the first experience of that sort of environment and we train at Ravenscraig so we've got quality facilities mm -hmm. to use but I think it's getting them active as early as possible so we'll start with games of touch right from the start but real high tempo reduced numbers games that feeds into some skills and then feeds into a bigger 15 on 15 game so we'll, we'll but for me, that's what we love. It's like get them running, get them active, get them playing games. And we'll, we'll condition different games. We'll put different, depending on what the session is going to be around. But they are fairly consistent themes across the programme for us. But it's like get them active, get them playing games. And then we, we slow it down, do a little breakout, do some skill zone work, and then back into like bigger picture games and play from scrums and all nights and, and that side of things. But yeah, that's what I enjoy because you watch them just getting up and getting running. You give them the freedom to play. So we just... We don't constrain the game too much. You give them the freedom to run and play and you watch how creative they become. Whereas too often, from my coaching past, is we, we stop that, we stop the creativity. Now actually just go, look, yeah, you can do what you like. You can kick, you can play anything you like. And it just, it changes the energy of the whole session. So 
yeah, I think as a coach as well, you can you can feed off that energy, and you're you know a massive contributor into that learning environment where, you know, you're genuinely getting excited about watching the players express themselves. Um, but what I'm hearing there, Chris, you know, lots of you know game based activity, a wee bit of competition. Yeah. Um, like Claire, what would what would be your you know go to activities or what what are you enjoying coaching at the moment? What are you playing about with? What are you what are your stock activities, I suppose? Yeah, kind of similar to Chris, it's around getting them engaged and, and excited about the session as early as possible. So um, I always try and do some sort of like very brief five minute handling practice, even if it is just a little bit more skills based to get them going, just to get them switched on. I find that from a university point of view, especially. And again, with the thistles, just the demographic of those players that they've come from a day of maybe sitting in lectures or or looking at a screen so just to get them something quite simple like hand catch pass to get them into that to start with normally means the session is going to go a little bit better because they can kind of park the day um, so we get them into that and then we will tend to go into um, either a skills into a game or a game into a skills depending on how we're how we're running the sessions um, and again through the university we'll probably go more skills into games um, and then design the games around what it is we're trying to get from that session. So if we're we're looking at, um, you know, we're playing a team maybe has a real hard defensive press, we'll play games where players can go offside um, in the defensive team. So we have to adapt and, you know, work out what the problem is and, and change our style of play against that. Um, and then again for the Thistles, because we're a really condensed programme, we probably spent a little bit more time on units and, and structured play or sort of starter plays than, than what I would do if it was a, a full season because we only had seven weeks and we had four games in seven weeks. So we had to make sure that we had a functioning line out, a functioning um, set piece and we had some starter plays. So yeah, it's slightly different, but I will always try and finish with some sort of game um, at the end that is linked to the session outcomes. Yeah, class. You know just uh, like loving hearing you speak about it and obviously you're you're hugely passionate about it which is which is awesome but um i heard you mention um like solving problems within that so you know we've we've got you know clan battles within our you know blueprint session design um and that would be heavily focused on on problem solving and actually getting the players to to do that themselves so like you mentioned you're dealing with line speed sending an offside player so would there be any other things that you'd sort of set that, that the, the players would look to then solve yeah, yeah loads of loads of things um that's one example um a couple of other examples will be we sometimes use different colored balls um so you know how you like you throw in a second ball but as soon as the orange ball comes in they decide what it's going to be and it could be that your team and my team have two different rules for what they're going to do with that orange ball so when i'm attacking it might be we're allowed to offload, but for you, you're allowed um, two passes um, or the first pass is free or something. So you get to choose and then the opposition team will then have to try and work out exactly what what you're doing. Um, and it just brings that problem solving element into it. But it's also a little bit of free flow for the player. So it's, it's not me stipulating what I want the rules to be. They can do it, but it allows them to problem solve. Because we could stand there and go, all right, the orange ball, you want to light offload, but then the attack know and the defence know what's what's coming. You don't know that in a game when you go and play on a Saturday, Wednesday. So by allowing the players to choose and it be different from each team, it just means that they have to think on the hoof and, and come up with solutions themselves. I love it. Thinking on the hoof, that is that's what it's all about really, isn't it? Um I love hearing about that, you know, real intentional second ball that we can use, you know, and, and if it's a different colour it focuses on you know, cue recognition and maybe just energises the players even further. Um, yeah, I've never really heard of the players deciding the rules for that second ball. As a coach, it's like you have to let go quite a lot. Have you been sat there trying to work out you know, what, does, what are they trying to do with this? Totally. You yeah. like come back together, go with your coach and like, so what were they doing with that orange <laughs> ball? And you're like, please someone answer it. Please, I'm not quite sure. Or, oh, yeah. or like you're trying to draw out the players without like going, well, mm. they were definitely doing this. So again, trying to sometimes step back as a coach and yeah. um, you can either see the picture and you're like let's let's step back because you want them to solve it mm -hmm. because 
Um, as I say, in games, the, the impact you can have or the amount of times you can get information to them is, is actually really small. Yeah. So you want them to be able to solve problems, or I, I definitely want them to be able to solve problems themselves um, and come up with solutions uh, rather than me give them it because I, I'm not I'm not one of those 15 players on a definitely. on a game day. And the opposition aren't going to tell you what they're doing, no. are they? <laughs> Sadly <laughs> the not. numbers in the line out, that's the only other time. <laughs> That, that just um, to jump back to when you were speaking before, you said you've got a lot of, lot of players who've been sat at a, maybe a computer screen all day or in lectures or, you know, some of them potentially working. Um, and, and for me, just that initial part of the session might include a, a little bit of sort of decompression in terms of like, you know, having a bit of a muck about. And that's something within the blueprint um, that, that we would try to be intentional with and... You know, I've, I saw I saw a couple of your sessions with the the national team, and the players always arrive, and they love a bit of spike ball, don't they? they so do. what, like for for you guys, what's that all about? It is just that it's a little bit of. Um, or what spike ball to start with? If you've ball, never seen spike never, ball. Spike ball is a is a little net, and then you've got this sort of plastic ball, and you've got to, like basically smash the ball off the net, and you're in teams and. It can't bounce a certain number of times. I'm not very good at it, so I don't really know the rules. I get I get kicked out when I try and play. But yeah, it's it, it just kind of lets them again switch off and have a little bit of fun, a bit of a laugh. Um, but also basic things, hand eye coordination, um, working with with your teammates. So you know it could be me and Chris against yourself and James, and we're having to communicate and because I can't touch it twice, so it's how we how we work together. But it just gives a and it just always brings a good buzz. So then you go into the session, um, and they're already excited about it because they've had a bit of a bit of fun before they've started. It's probably a wee bit of like physical activity going on in there, where they're having to lunge to the Definitely, side yeah. or I get that get that brain switched on a wee bit. But um, like Chris, we've got a few other things up on the slide there. Is there anything for you that's that's jumping out that that you would like to speak about? I suppose. We, we'll do muck about similar with, with, the, with, the, with the boys' eye because they've been in school all day and it's like, but give them the freedom to play, but we'll let them come up with games. Mm -hmm. We'll let them, they, they can decide what they want to do rather than us going, we're going to do this or do that. And I think that works really well as, as a point for them to just sort of relax and, and get into it before we start doing. We'll do a lot of sort of small sided games, small small work on areas, but it won't be, it won't be old technique zone. It'll be very skill zone type small numbers, four on four, three on two, four on two. If you look in defence, you might go four defenders against three attackers. So we'll do a lot of that as part of our session after the 10 on 10 sort of touch game. So we won't go 15 on 15 touch to start. It'll be more eight on eight, depending on the numbers we've got, 10 on 10, two games going, then into sort of skill zone stuff that's, that's slightly smaller numbers again, but lots of goes, but, but still competitive, still not just repping stuff for the sake of repping it. Uh, and then back into the bigger game. So yeah, we'll use a lot of the wee game stuff, which would be more sort of skill zone type practices. Nice, so having that like flexibility to sort of jump between skill zone and wee games would be, you know, key. And I think my point here is, we've been chatting a load about, about planning, um, you know, being organized, but James, when, when does that just have to go out the window a wee bit? When do we have to be adaptable? I mean, there's a myriad of factors. So, I mean, I think in my, my experiences is like the ch a change of facility space. Right, we turn up to uh, the university, right, that half the pitch is now out of commission. Okay, cool. Um, still doesn't change the fact we've got 60 or 70 players there. So we have a couple of things and we design our sessions to try and account for that. So if there's big space, we can just do it in bigger areas. But we use a lot of square games for these Wii games. So um, your corner ball, we've got an adaptation of five pass, we call melt ball, where the defending team have bags and they just have to try and hit the attacking team out of the square and it teaches about movement body position things like that the guys like it as a bit of an energizer um like say chaos squares really good like attacking out to in into out sometimes we've started a game and the energy has been so good that we just rolled with it so we do a space saving game where it's a three-team attack where it's constantly going round and there's a tactical element like so every touch the number of points you get for a try diminishes, but then the defender drops out. And if the players are really repping into it, you can just layer a few tactical things on there. And we've actually found real value in like, do you know what, let's just keep going with this. It's like cold night, the, the, the energy is really high. We're learning a lot from it. And it's just like, you look around the other coaches and go, right, let's see what we can really get out of this. And I think that's probably 
one thing that when I first started coaching, I was very prescriptive as to what was on the papers, what we're doing. But you do learn like bits and pieces. Like the plan is a plan, and because you want to get through stuff. But every now and then, you just think this is getting everything I want out of this session. So let's explore this a bit more. So are we talking about like flow now and having yeah. that like coach's eye and I suppose coach's feel, mm -hmm. you know, for the group, for the energy, for the for the learning. Are they getting it? You know, um, what sort of things like Claire would you? incorporate in your sessions to make sure it has a good flow yeah i think it's all around for me it's what you're trying to achieve to start with mm -hmm. so so what is your your session aims and then how you design your your whole session around that um and like what i said before we'd probably go with that sort of skill zone game zone type type approach um and, and yeah as, as james says adapt it as as needed it might be that on your session plan you're going to do these three rules or these three conditions sorry but then when you get there, you're like, that's either that's not not working or actually th they've got that. So let's really advance it. And you've got to sometimes think on the, the hoof and work with your coaches as well, your co-coaches to, to come to what's the best for the players. And I'm a big believer that sometimes the best sessions are the ones where you as a coach and your players go away and you're actually a little bit frustrated because for me, a perfect session isn't what we want to achieve because there will always be a problem in a game. You know, very rarely, if ever, are you ever going to have that all 15 players having the perfect game and everything works the way you want it. It might happen, but um, not always. So um, how do we keep pushing the players and keep challenging them outside their comfort zone the whole time? So they go away and they feel they've achieved something, but they also still feel a little bit maybe uneasy um, about things that they could do better and then how do they then go away and reflect on that and, and come back to it from there? You can actually plan for that because I've seen, I think it was Kieran Beattie when he was in the role with the women's national team, he actually showed us a session plan. And he t the first column was like, is this going to be a stretch part of the session or is there going to be some safety in it? So I think that intent, everyone's on the same page. Like We know this is going to cause frustration. There's going to be mistakes, but that's okay because it's supposed to be that way. The players know it, the coaches know it the coach behavior reflects that. It's not like getting frustrated. It's almost like encouraging and, but you're right. Like what is the purpose of training is very philosophical. It's to push yourself. So when you come to a game, it's actually, you've seen things. So if it's safe and we, we say that on level one, like should a good session have no drop balls? And it's like, balance like, it's coaches like order. Like, oh yeah, don't like, don't like mistakes. But actually, as you said, is that really achieving what training's for? It's uh, I think it's important as well as a coach, how you, like you say, how you react to things that maybe aren't aren't going as well or isn't that perfect picture. If your players are comfortable with you as a coach because you're you're creating an environment where it's okay to try things mm -hmm. and it might not stick, but it's like, well, what did you learn from that? What, did, what picture did you see there? What else could have happened? Then then that allows them to, to feel comfortable to try things. Mm -hmm. If it's always that there's a right answer and a wrong answer, they're only ever going to do one thing in my view. So allow them to have the freedom to try things. But my behavior as a coach really impacts what they will or won't do in a training session. Definitely. And it's, it's the unintentional things in that we see like sometimes like do a press up if you drop a ball or things like that. And like, it's probably well intended, but what does that mean? It's like, well, actually, if I make a mistake, then I get punished. So I'll probably play within myself or maybe create, it might create anxiety around that activity, but. I was, I was going to say, it's a, I think it's a great point about the coach's role in all this, is that it's really hard to step back and let chaos reign. Yeah. And, but that's our job, and, and you, you've got to step back and go, let them solve it, because it, it's so easy for us to go, boom, I'm going to step in here and deal with Actually, step back and going and let the chaos reign, and then pulling out at the end. So we had a session the other day that was so... We went 15 on 15 to pre prepare for the games, and it was so chaotic and so messy. And we, we, we just stood back and just let them play and then put it off another restart, played off different places and let them play. But the learnings at the end is, okay, what did you learn from that? And that was the key, not us jumping in, not saying anything, just, okay, what are you taking away from this? How are you going to learn from that? And it, it was a real challenge because we're all wanting to say something or, or do something and actually don't just sit back and say absolutely nothing and let them solve it. It was, it was quality, but yeah, I think it's a really important thing. It's just that um, ability for the coach to be comfortable with a little bit of uncertainty and you know ultimately trying to let that transfer to the players as well um 
So I think just uh, just sort of moving on a little bit, um, we like within that session who like we have objectives that we're looking to achieve. Um, how you know how do we sort of get there and how how can we be flexible within our you know flow of the session in that maybe the players surprise us from time to time so what what sort of interventions or chris or or things might you do if, if that sort of occurs as in the you, you achieve the objectives like really early on in the session i think it's going back to the point you made earlier about the coaches being adaptable and i think every session you have to be adaptable i don't think there's any particular time you can sit back and go this is what i'm doing because i think every session goes in a different flow changes direction and, and and you have to adapt it all the time and i think recognize what's going well and having another plan and it might be you go off to do something totally different actually i'm going to park this just now because i don't think we need to work on this i'm going to go and i'm going to go and cover this because i think going back to defense earlier it's like our passing's really great, our attack's brilliant. Let's let's keep that going, but let's then focus a little bit on defence. And, and that, for me, is the adaptability of the coaching team and to be able to go, that's brilliant, that's quality. Let's let's see if we can challenge it a little bit more by by increasing our defensive focus or whatever. Of course, so Scotty, you'd spot on the screen this model, and we use this in our uh, aspiring coaching course and advanced coaching course. And I think it's a model by um, a coaching academic from I think Leeds Becker, uh, Bob Muir. And we kind of put this up as kind of being like, these are the kind of core ingredients when you're kind of planning a session that all need to interact for basically objectives to be uh, achieved. So we were just chatting uh, in the wee music break we just had about as coaches, we're pretty decent at doing those kind of top three. But actually, how do you plan for player engagement? Because you said it off the top that actually, in the level of program that both you guys are working at, is that you're there to kind of make sure the players are leaders and they know what the how to kind of like solve problems and things like that so yeah how do you just like, I suppose the question is how do you plan for player engagement and what part of the planning process are they involved in I guess the first thing for me is I always want to know a little bit about the player and, and that, that person and, and get to know them so then I can understand how you work differently to somebody else so mm -hmm. a little bit around around that to start with um, and, and then you'll have your leadership groups as well where you can you can feed into and get information from them, so yeah, for me it's all about the person and, and how I get to, to know them. Even just that little chat before training, you know, they turn up, how you doing James, how's your day been? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's been, it's been a really stressful day at uni. You know, and then before, before the session starts, I've got a little marker to know that, okay, if you're not on it, it's maybe because you've had a really tiring day or you've got an assignment due or um, you've come from work if it's for the thistles, so, you know, you've had a big a big day at work in the morning. You've travelled three hours to get to to BT Murrayfield for training, and you know all these little things. So yeah, I think for me it's all around knowing knowing the people and understanding what makes them tick, and and just having those little conversations when they're even playing their energizer games. You know, little chats with them there and then. That's the other, you talked about Mocha, but it was actually a chance just to kind of like set that relaxed tone, isn't it? And you talk about leadership groups. Do they help shape your sessions? Like they feed back, Claire, we love this, or we want a bit more of this, or... It, it varies, yeah. it varies. Um, maybe something, you know, reflecting, something I can do better, definitely. I think there is, there is more opportunity to involve them mm. um, a little bit more throughout the season rather than maybe, you know, start a review midway through and then at the end so how do we make sure that those players are involved throughout the season I, I always pick up little conversations here and there but maybe not in a formal a formal sense or mm -hmm. you know we'll sit down and have a, a coffee and a chat about it maybe as frequently as we should so mm -hmm. definitely something for me as a coach I think I can do better it's something that I only picked up like last year and because like, I've got quite a, a fast flowing attitude towards training like lots of games base and the players just like I really want a bit more like contact stuff because <laughs> it makes <laughs> them feel better. Like we're playing some massive English teams. Like if we do more contact, I'm like oh yeah, like we'll factor in and we factor in the session. Like oh class, that 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 made me feel a lot better and feel a bit more confident. And I was like just just say these things and it's like yeah, they were almost a bit afraid to come and approach, but it enabled me to kind of get that feedback and to go and I've got an idea of what I suppose that game plan of what we want to do, but ultimately what the players feel is a big part of it. So, yeah, I was saying it's something that I, it took me years to work out. And actually, when it did happen, I was like, that wasn't too painful. And it, and doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have to be in a formal setting, yeah. does it? Like you say, it can be in those, those games. And, and I think that's where knowing your players really helps because mm -hmm. you're comfortable asking them how they are or they're comfortable to come to you before session and Definitely. say, look, I've, 
this and that, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit tired today or, you know, I didn't sleep last, wh whatever it happens to be. And then mm -hmm. they feel comfortable that you're not going to be frustrated that maybe they can't take part in the whole session or you yeah. have to modify parts of it for them. And again, it's all about that for me, that coach athlete relationship and how we work together as a, as a team, because me, my coaches, um, my medical staff, my management, we're a team and how we work with our players is really important. Mm. It's a big part of it. Like in the academies, you've got big numbers. Like I've seen one of your sessions at Ravenscraig and it was a big old session. So how do you kind of plan for player engagement? Because you've got a short window to try and get, basically give some of these players some of the best rugby experiences they can. I know that's a big thing of like what the Falls Rock Academy lot to do is give them real positive experiences. So how do you go about planning for that? I suppose it's, it's exactly the same. It's knowing the players. It's spending time in that five, ten minutes on pitch, muck around time chatting to them individually. Mm -hmm. Chatting to parents is obviously really important for us, connecting with parents, club coaches, school coaches. So there's a lot of conversations go between school and club coaches as well. But most importantly, the parents when they arrive as well is just saying hi to them because they're generally coming dropping the lads off. Uh, but speaking to the boys, speaking to the players, how's your week going, but not speaking rugby. I think that's the key. It's asking questions away from rugby. It's all very good. How was your game at the weekend? How did you, were you playing at the weekend? Whatever. But actually, how's school? How's work? How's whatever? Like create the connection and listen to the answer. That then allows you to get a feel for the energy. Knowing school timetables, it's a bit influenced by that as well. I think also energizing, when I was working with the Futures, we, we let them pick a session occasionally and the amazing energy that comes off it when, when they choose a session. We give them a number, like almost like selection boxes. You pick, here's the topic you can work on, here's this, here's the way you're doing it. They picked it and the engagement from the group that session was probably the best session I ever did and it, because the players bought into it. So it might just be as simple as sharing, you know, the outcomes or the session plan with the players prior, because they'll all be different and they'll all process things at different speeds in different ways. That maybe if they know that they're going to receive information of what the focus of the session, then they'll they'll think about it and they'll maybe come in a slightly different frame of mind. Yeah. Um, but I was I was loving hearing you listen, Claire, about knowing knowing players um, about who are the who are the drivers, who are the energizers, who are the architects of the group, who are the players who maybe come on more than one occasion that are maybe a little bit, you know, need a wee bit more of a an, an ener energizer prior. Um, but it's uh, just, I think we're, we're, we're chatting about session design and flow and then objectives and, you know, structure and it all is very holistic. Mm -hmm. James was mentioning that previously. But I think what we'll what we'll do as well is just on the screen we'll, we'll share a few different examples of yeah. you know of, of different session plans and like as the players are all different coaches are all different as well so you'll see four different <laughs> ways of doing it from four different coaches definitely yeah geez there's more than more than one way to skin a cat isn't there Absolutely. and that's like and that's where the, the flexibility that's where the fun the enjoyment and yeah. also having uh you know if, if we're co-coaching if we're working with other you know, coaches or you mentioned medics or S and C or other parents if we're working with minis, you know, it's it's having that buy in from the coaching group that then leads to that shared experience with the with the players. But that has been an awesome chat, guys. Just uh thanks very much for coming on, Claire. And good to see you, Chris. Uh, you. James, no as always a pleasure. And same to you, Scott. Same to me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um but yeah, just we'll we'll stick that up and if there's there's any comments then then please please do so below. Cheers and out.